So, uh, can we start now? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we welcome to weekly webinar organized by College of Physician Malaysia. We are now in week one, gastroenterology and hepatology month for the year 2024. And topic for today is liver disorders in pregnancy. Uh, we are very fortunate and welcome to it. And fortunate to welcome our speaker is Dr. Ho Chai Zen, gastroenterologist and hepatologist hospital Selayang. And our chairperson for today is Dr. Tan Siok Siang, who's a senior consultant, gastroenterologist and hepatologist hospital Selayang. Dr. Tan is, a, is previously a national head of gastro and also a head of hepatology unit in hospital Selayang. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome Dr. Tan. Hi, can you hear me now? Hmm, yes, okay. yes. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Just now I lost contact there. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Dr. Tan Sok Siam. I'm a hepatologist working in Salayan Hospital. I'm delighted to chair the first medical webinar for the year 2024, organized by the College of Physicians of Malaysia. Thank you for, uh, to the college for inviting me to chair. And with great honor, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Hu chai Zen, is a consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist with interest in liver transplant. Dr. Hu graduated from the Royal College of Surgeons Island and had worked in various hospitals in the uh, Ministry of Health in Kuang, Malacca, KL, and currently in Slayang Hospital. She has uh, recently completed a one-year fellowship in uh, liver transplant in St. James's Hos uh, University Hospital in Leeds, UK. So Dr. Hu will talk to us on liver disorders in pregnancy today. And I would like to encourage everyone to send in your uh, questions for Dr. Hu. So over to you, Dr. Hu. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. Thank you, Dr. Tan, for the kind introduction. And also thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to talk in today's webinar entitled Liver Disorders in Pregnancy, Approach and Management. Uh, can you see my slides moving? Oh, it's not moving yet. Oh my God, let me see. Okay, can you see the slides yes. moving? Can you ready? Yeah, yes. okay. So the content of my talk today would cover the diagnostic approach to liver disorder in pregnancy, uh, I will also then talk a little bit about acute fatty liver in pregnancy and intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy before discussing a case related to acute fatty liver in pregnancy and then we will be open for question and answer session. The content of my talk today uh, are obtained from the ESO Clinical Practice Guidelines on the Management of Liver Diseases in Pregnancy, as well as the uh, AASLD uh, Practice Guideline entitled Reproductive Health and Liver Disease, Practice Guidance by the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. When we see a patient who is pregnant and has possible liver disorder, we categorize them into two buckets and they can be non-pregnancy associated liver disease, which occurs half the time, or pregnancy associated liver disease, which occurred the other half the time. In a patient with non-pregnancy associated liver disease, this patient has a liver disorder which coincidentally occur while the patient was pregnant. This includes viral hepatitis, paracetamol overdose, drug-induced liver injury, autoimmune hepatitis, PBC, primary biliary cholangitis, PSC, primary sclerosing cholangitis, cancers, or the gallstone disorders. Whereas, 
patients with pregnancy-associated liver disease includes conditions like preeclampsia, ICP, which is intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy, health, which is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelet, hyperemesis gravidarum, and acute fatty liver in pregnancy. Before initiating a workup, clinicians should be familiar with the normal biochemical changes seen in pregnancy. And that includes uh, looking at the changes in the first, second, and third trimester. Liver biochemistry like ALT, ASD, gamma GT, bilirubin level, as well as bile acid, should be as what it is in the pre-pregnancy state. ALP will be normal in the first trimester, and it's expected to be increased in the second and the third trimester because it is excreted from the placenta. The albumin tend to be normal in the first trimester or slightly decreased, and they can be normal or most likely decreased in the second and the third trimester due to hemodilution. Alpha fetoprotein tend to be normal or a little bit increased in the first trimester, and they will be increased in the second and third trimester because they are excreted from the placenta as well. Other than the biochemical uh, biochemistry test mentioned earlier, we also, we also need to be wary that some of the non-invasive liver screen that we send may have changes in the parameter during pregnancy. And this includes serum, colis, uh, sorry, serum ceruloplasmin, which will be increased in pregnancy, and the concentration of IgG, IgA, and IgM will be decreased significantly in the second and third trimester. IgM level as well as M2 antibody titer may be decreased in pregnancy, but return to baseline level in postpartum. So in other words, in patients whom we suspect conditions like Wilson's disease, uh, if the serum ceruloplasmin is normal during, during pregnancy, but they have other risk, and the liver function test continues to be abnormal post-delivery, and we still suspect a possibility of Wilson disease, it is worthwhile repeating serum ceruloplasmin. Similarly, in a patient whom we suspect, for example, primary biliary cholangitis, who has normal IgM level, a negative um, AMA or M2 antibody, body, but we still have high index of suspicion for PBC in this cohort of patients, we should plan to repeat these investigations during the postpartum period. Now, moving on to the diagnostic approach to liver disease in pregnancy. Evaluation of a pregnant woman without known liver disease will be similar to that of a non-pregnant individual. However, the testing needs to balance risk to mother and fetus against the information obtained and must be interpreted in the context of gestational age. For example, if we think that the patient needs further more invasive investigation, such as liver biopsy, maybe because there is progressive liver disease uh, during the period of gestation, it is something that we can still consider doing. Although generally, we tend to postpone invasive procedures like liver biopsy to the period uh, after the postpartum. Initial evaluation starts with history, including medications and supplements, physical examination, and laboratory assessment. History taking is very important in this group of patients because sometimes our physical examination is a little bit limited. So history that uh, information that would be important to know would be any known personal and family history of prior liver disease. For example, family history of any viral hepatitis, uh, whether the patient previously was diagnosed with any liver disease before, for example, autoimmune hepatitis. 
risk factors for liver disease, including use of injecting drugs or other blood-borne exposures to hepatitis C or hepatitis B, any metabolic risk factors for metabolic dysfunction associated steatotic liver disease. So that also includes a history of diabetes, any obesity, as well as getting history of alcohol consumption. Any prior pregnancy history, example, history of preeclampsia or intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy. What are the current symptoms? in this pregnancy. Example, any nausea, vomiting, pruritus, abdominal pain, or altered sensorium. And in a patient who has pruritus, for example, it will be good to know what is the distribution of the pruritus, whether there is any associated rashes, uh, what is the, um, what is the um, whether the pruritus is worse during daytime or nighttime. As mentioned earlier, physical examination can be limited by uh, physical changes that happens during pregnancy. Of course, if there is presence of scleral iterus, it is something that is good to take note of. But examination of ascites could be quite difficult in a gravid uterus. Presence of palmar erythema can be rather non-specific in a pregnant patient because this could be normal physical changes during pregnancy. Presence of lower limb edema can also be normal in a pregnancy. So it is not very helpful. When we do liver function tests, it is important to look at the pattern of liver derangement, whether it is hepato hepatocellular or cholestatic, and that will then guide us for further testing. This flow chart shows how we should evaluate an abnormal liver test in pregnancy. The approach is rather similar in a pregnant co uh, patient compared to a non-pregnant patient but we must take into consideration diseases unique to pregnancy based on the gestational age. So for example, if the patient shows more of a cholestatic pattern, which is rise in ALP and gamma GT, the investigation that we should uh, do includes an ultrasound. Likely Doppler will not be uh, useful in this case. So an ultrasound to look for any biliary tree obstruction, any dilated ducts, intrahepatic or uh, at the common bowel duct, whether there was any gallstone. If this is negative, we should that then consider conditions like drug-induced liver injury, primary biliary cholangitis or primary sclerosing cholangitis. And with that, we can send investigation like AMA, anti-mitochondrial antibody, PBC-specific anti-nuclear antibodies, and they generally show perinuclear rims, nuclear dot, or centromere pattern. Um, sending liver-specific autoantibodies uh, will also be helpful. And a positive GP210 as well as SP100 would be diagnostic of PBC as well. If patient is suspected to have PSC, we can organize a non-contrast MRCP and we can see beaded appearance in this MRCP. On the other hand, if the patient show a hepatocellular pattern of uh, liver injury, we should consider conditions like viral hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, drug-induced liver injury, NASH or alcohol-related liver disease, Wilson disease, celiac disease, which is not very common among Malaysians, or vascular disease. Now, vascular disease like Bud Chiari, um, is not often precipitated by pregnancy. However, they can manifest during pregnancy, especially if the patient has underlying thrombophilia. Investigations that we can send to investigate this includes hepatitis A virus IgM, 
HBS antigen, HEP-B core IgM, HPV DNA, anti-HCV antibody. And acute HEP E is something that uh, we must keep in mind in our differential because patients uh, who are pregnant are more susceptible to acute HEP E. And if they do get it, the outcome is worse and they have higher risk of going into acute liver failure. Other viruses that we must not forget include uh, HSV, CMV, and EBV. We can actually send IgM, although of course PCR would be more diagnostic, but the turnaround time would be longer. For investigation of O2 immune hepatitis, we can send ANA, anti-smooth muscle antibody, IgG will be raised. Um, and if Wilson disease is suspected, serum ceruloplasmin can be sent. We can get our ophthalmology collect, uh, colleague to do a sleep lamp examination to look for any KF ring uh, and also consider sending 24-hour urine copper. Not forgetting in this group of patients also diseases that are unique in pregnancy and based on the gestational age. So conditions like hyperemesis gravidarum intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy, acute fatal liver in pregnancy, or hypertensive diseases of pregnancy such as preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndrome should be considered. For that, we can send bowel acid level, reticulocyte count, and heptoglobin if HELP syndrome is suspected, uric acid and urine protein will be raised in preeclampsia or eclampsia, and coagulation study is important to look at the function of the liver, just like how we assess whether there is any hepatic encephalopathy and whether the bilirubin is raised. All this will make us more worried because that means the function of the liver is affected. Of course, low albumin is helpful in a non-pregnant patient. However, in a pregnant patient, because of hemodilution, low albumin tend to be less specific. This diagram shows the typical time of onset for diseases unique to pregnancy. Hyperemesis gravidarum typically occur in the first trimester and rarely the symptom can persist throughout the pregnancy. Uh, intra uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy generally present after 30 weeks of gestation, but they can uh, present in the late of first trimester as well. Preeclampsia, by definition, occurs after 20th week of gestation, and the HELP syndrome occurs between week 27 and 37. Although a small percentage of them actually can occur in the postpartum period. Acute fatal liver in pregnancy tend to occur in the third trimester of pregnancy and rarely in up to a quarter of the cases they can present in the postpartum period. So now moving on, I'll talk a bit about uh, acute fatal liver in pregnancy. This is important because it is both a medical and obstetric emergency as it can cause maternal and fetal mortality if not identified and managed promptly. The incidence is between 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 20,000 births. They typically present at the third trimester in pregnancy at a mean gestation of about 35 weeks plus minus 6 weeks. As mentioned earlier, up to about 25% of them can present in the postpartum period. The etiology for acute fatty liver in pregnancy is thought to be because of maternal and or, or fetal disorders of fatty acid metabolism. This subsequently leads to accumulation of fatty acid metabolites in the maternal hepatocytes, which may overwhelm mitochondrial capacity and subsequently resulting in mitochondrial dysfunction and leading to acute liver failure. The risk factor for acute fatty liver in pregnancy includes extremes of maternal age, low BMI, pregnancy-induced hypertension, multi-fetal pregnancy, fetal growth restriction, and a male fetus.
The signs and symptoms of acute fatty liver in pregnancy includes nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, anorexia, fatigue, polyuria and polydipsia. And in the physical examination, you can see that they have scleroecterus, jaundice, and hepatic encephalopathy. The Swansea criteria have been used for the diagnosis for acute fatty liver in pregnancy. And if the patient scores six or more in the Swansea criteria, the sensitivity to uh, diagnose this is about 100% and the specificity is around 57%. Swansea criteria includes vomiting, abdominal pain, polyuria polydipsia, and encephalopathy. These are the four, um, four criteria that can be found in um, um, history taken and examination. And as for blood parameter, the bilirubin can be raised, although it is only uh, more than 14, so not very markedly raised. To fulfill the criteria, they tend to get hypoglycemia, uric acid will be raised, white cell count raised, or ascites or bright liver on ultrasound, ALT, AST more than 42, ammonia of more than 47, creatinine of more than 150, a prolonged PT of more than 14 seconds, or APTT of more than 34 seconds. And if liver biopsy is done, although rarely uh, liver biopsy will be done, uh, Presence of microvesicular steatosis on the liver biopsy is also one of the criteria for uh, Swansea criteria. Biochemical markers or clinical features in women with acute fatty liver in pregnancy that are able to predict risk of deterioration and need for intensive care unit admission include some scores that we do, which is MELT score, I'll show you shortly and also Swansea criteria. So in women with acute fatty liver or pregnancy who develop encephalopathy or have elevated serum lactate of more than 2.8 or a MELT score of more than 30 or who score more than 7 on the Swansea criteria, they should be considered for level 2 or level 3 care. Um, so I talked to you about MELT score just now. MELT score can be easily done with our online calculator and the variables that need to be imputed in this calculation includes creatinine level, bilirubin level, INR, as well as uh, sodium. And when you key in all these variables, you will get the score. Now, management of women with acute fatty liver in pregnancy uh, is as below. The delivery should be expedited once coagulopathy and remedial metabolic derangement have been treated. That is, if the patient has hypoglycemia, we treat it and we give a blood product transfusion in order to correct the coagulopathy. Use of plasma exchange post-delivery may be considered to improve maternal disease severity and decrease the time to recovery in women with acute fatty liver of pregnancy and severe hepatic impairment. The use of NAC can be considered in women requiring admission to the ICU and in a subset of patients with acute fatty liver or pregnancy who have severe hepatic impairment and may require transplantation, early referral to a transplant center should be made. Now I'll move on to the second uh, liver disorder related to pregnancy and that is intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy. This is the commonest gestational liver disorder affecting approximately 0.4 to 10% of the pregnancies. About a quarter of the women affected by ICP have heterozygous mutations in the biliary transporters ABCB4, ABCB11, and ATP8B1, and a smaller proportion have mutations in other genes implicated in cholestasis. The risk factors for intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy includes advanced maternal age, multiparity, metabolic syndrome, patient having hepatitis C virus infection, and a personal or family history of ICP. Patients with ICP will tell you that they have generalized pruritus. Pruritus can be quite prominent in this patient. 
and they are more severe in the palms and soles and tend to be worse at night. Typically, they have no accompanying rash and their onset is in the second or third trimester. Bio biochemical abnormalities that we could expect includes increased bowel acid level, aminotransferases will be raised up to two to tenfold, and in about a third of the women with ICP, they can have raised bilirubin level. ALP may increase, but it is of di limited diagnostic value in a pregnant patient. Pregnancy management in a patient with ICP includes patients who has confirmed ICP should have serum bowel acid measured at least weekly from 32 weeks gestation to identify those with concentrations more than or equals to 40 micromole per liter who are at an increased risk of with a serum bowel acid concentration more than of stillbirth increases after 35 weeks of gestation and hence elective early delivery should be planned to reduce the risk of fetal death. The American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists actually recommends delivery at 36 to 37 weeks of, of gestation or at diagnosis if diagnosed after 37 weeks of acid level. Because pruritus can be quite prominent in a patient with ICP to keep their fingernails short, to evade any severe skin damage, we should encourage the patient to use light. This is aggravated. Sleep fine using topical moisturizing agent. So we have a uh, aqueous cream with menthol content to be helpful in alleviating this pruritus symptom. They can use this however frequent that they need. Um and if we do not have this in our pharmacy, uh, you can actually get the patient to buy it from the uh, outside pharmacy. Also to take note, although the symptom of pruritus can reduce quality of life, they typically resolve rather quickly within days to weeks postpartum. The pharmacological treatment for ICP would be for the pruritus as well as to improve the outcome of the fetus. Also, the oxycholic acid given at the dose of 10 to 15 mg per kg per day can be considered as part of the treatment of maternal pruritus, although the effect is relatively small and it is also found to be protective uh, against stillbirth. In patients with serum bowel acid concentration more than or equals to 40 micromole per liter. When you want to prescribe urso deoxycholic acid, UDCA, uh, we tend to start at a low dose. So, for example, 250 milligram OD and titrate upwards every three days or so. So, if you start at 250 milligram OD, then you can titrate up after three days to 250 milligram BD. And then subsequently, after three days, you can increase further to 500 milligram AM, 250 milligram PM. And generally, that will be the dose that, that, that is suitable, depending on the weight of the patient, of course. Uh, in a patient with refractory pruritus, uh, other agents such as antihistamine, rifampicin, or cholestyramine have been suggested. Antihistamine can be quite useful. Um, uh, for example, pyriton can be quite useful in a patient with uh, intrahepatic cholestasis in pregnancy because their itchiness tend to be worse at night and that affects their ability to sleep. So pyriton may help 
alleviate the itchiness a little bit, but more importantly, it can help the patient to sleep at night. Cholestyramine uh, comes in powder formulation. You can prescribe cholestyramine uh, at a dose of 4 mg OD or BD. Some people find it quite, uh, quite unpalatable uh, because it doesn't really taste good. It, it sort of tastes like clay. Um, it, 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 it is a powder form that you dissolve in water. But if you give cholestyramine to your patient for cruritis, uh, you must make sure that you get it two hours before and two hours after other medications that the patient take because that can uh, affect the absorption of the other medications. Rifampicin is a medication that we can give for pruritus. It is something that we almost never use because of uh, its notorious uh, reputation um, in causing, uh, put in potential to cause a possible deranged liver function test. But if the pruritus is very severe, uh, and it's not helped with UDCA, cholestyramine, the lifestyle modification that um, you have um, advised, then yes, rifampicin is a treatment option for pruritus. This table summarizes the other liver disease unique to pregnancy that I did not cover in, I, uh, in this talk, and that includes hyperemesis, gravidarum, and health syndrome. Um, I, this is not covered in this uh, talk because of time constraint, uh, but generally this table gives you the, um, the time of onset that you expect this uh, condition to happen, what are the laboratory findings associated with this, and what are the parameters that are needed to diagnose these um, conditions. And I'll skip that uh, because if, let's say, later you want the slide, I'm, I'm happy to share it with you. So now I'll move on to uh, my case presentation. And this is a case of acute fatty liver in pregnancy. So this is a 24-year-old para one who first presented at 36 weeks of gestation in mid-August to one of the clinic kesihatan in Kota Baru. She presented with nausea and vomiting and found to have jaundice and liver and renal abnormality. Unfortunately, I do not have the bilirubin as it is not documented in the referral letter, but uh, the creatinine then was 128, ALT 153, AST of 271. The patient was subsequently discharged from the clinic kesihatan with antibiotic and planned to see back in the clinic kesihatan in one week's time for further monitoring. Subsequently, from Kota Baru, she went to Alostar because that was the place that she uh, planned to deliver her baby and have confinement. She was at that point 37 weeks period of gestation. Uh, she still had vomiting and was found to have jaundice uh, during review in the clinic and was referred to Hospital Sutanabaya. There she was admitted, found to have multiple episodes of hypoglycemia and has asterixis consistent with hepatic encephalopathy. Blood parameter shows bilirubin raised at 148, ALT rising further to 277, ASD rising further to 402, creatinine rising further to 218, PT of 31.8 seconds, INR of 2.58 and APTT of 55.9 seconds, white cell count was raised at 11.75, and an ultrasound that was organized found to have fatty liver with liver span of about 12 cm. She was then diagnosed to have fulminant liver failure secondary to acute fatty liver in pregnancy. Patient fulfilled the Swansea criteria of uh, more than six points, she scored nine points. A hematology consult was obtained in order to correct the coagulopathy and patients subsequently uh, received multiple FFP as well as cryoprecipitate transfusion uh, prior to undergoing an emergency LSCS. Unfortunately, this resulted in her developing acute pulmonary edema and she was intubated prior to undergoing the surgery. 
uh, coagulation profile by prior to the surgery, PT improved to 19.1 second, INR of 1.5, APPT was 38.1 second. Despite delivery of the baby and sedation of the day after the surgery, there was no GCS recovery. Patient remained anuric and was on CVVHD. She was given IVI and NAC in an acute liver failure regime. And the blood parameters for this after delivery showed a raised white cell of 25.5, low platelet of 42. Creatinine was okay, 145 because of the CVVH. Bilirubin rising further to 427. ALT 11, AST 92, and an INR of 2.94. Melt sodium at that point was 44 and the melt score was 44. She was then transferred to the hospital Slayang for liver transplant consideration. Coincidentally, we have a liver graft offer at that point. She was quickly reviewed by the wider team involved in liver transplant in ICU then and was deemed suitable for liver transplant. She then underwent cadaveric liver transplant on the same day. Uh, she did have uh, quite an eventful post-liver transplant uh, recovery period, but was subsequently discharged well. Uh, she was last seen in November this year, liver graft functioning well. Kidney has normalized uh, and she is, um, she is okay, ADL, independent, able to care for the child. So with that, um, I conclude my talk today with some take-home messages. Evaluation of liver injury in pregnancy should include a comprehensive evaluation for underlying liver disease, as well as consideration for liver disease unique to pregnancy. We should pay special attention to clinical clues such as severe vomiting, nocturnal pruritus, hypertension, proteinuria, and the presence of hemolysis and thrombocytopenia because all of this will help guide us to coming to the correct diagnosis and provide the appropriate care for both the mother and the baby. We should have a low threshold to involve the multidisciplinary team, including the obstetrician, the hepatology and gastroenterology team. And if, uh, if the center does not have gastrohepatology, uh, um, department then consider um, involving the internal medical team, um, anesthesiologists as well as neonatologists. With that, I thank you for your attention and your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Thank you for an excellent overview. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, if you have any, please uh, uh, do not hesitate to type it into the chat box uh, and we will try our best to answer them. Oh, is there another section called Q&A? Yeah, I can see that. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Gender. Okay. Sorry, I have technical problems. I'm using my handphone. Uh, but okay, I think there was one question in the chat box. Oh, I closed everything. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, Dr. Tan. Uh, okay, all right. So um, before the question, uh, before asking the question in Q&A, there's one in the chat box before, so I can forget. Uh, the, the person who posed the question, I think it's Dr. Wong. Uh, Dr. Wong would like to know uh, how frequent is this uh, acute fatty liver uh, uh, in pregnancy uh, in Malaysia? Do you have any data, Dr. Hu? Um, to be very honest with you, I, I, I don't I don't really know uh how, how what what is the uh prevalence of, of acute fatty liver in pregnancy among Malaysian mothers. Um like I say, um the, the the frequency in the international data is one in ten thousand to one in twenty thousand pregnancies. To be very honest with you, uh whilst I was in Malaysia, I have not encountered any acute right. fatty liver in pregnancy. And and yeah. that patient that I, I talked to you about uh, in the case study, actually, um, I was not directly involved in the care of the patient during that time because I, I was not back in Slayang then. But yeah. uh, whilst I was in the UK for about a year, I have, uh -huh. I have 
personal experience with one patient with acute fatty liver and pregnancy. So I guess what I can conclude from that would be it is not very frequent. It is a rare condition, but because the patient is very ill, it is something that we must always uh, think about at the back of our mind. These patients are very sick. They, they look very agitated. And, and you know, you don't expect a, a, a pregnant mother to be like that. Yeah, that, that is what I would say. What about right. Dr. Okay. Uh, Tan? Um, what, what uh, have, you, have you encountered more yeah. patients? I, I, I would say, uh, to be throughout my practice, I think, unless I miss some, I think the total number should be about, couldn't be more than 10. And uh, certainly the, the case that you mentioned in the case presentation is the most severe I've seen that uh, needed a liver transplant. Fortunately, those other cases uh, that we I have encountered before uh, recover very soon after delivery. You know, we uh, previously we we uh, we have do we do have very sick patient. Probably they would have presented earlier than this case. This case do have some issue in terms of, you know, he she she keep on she went to a few healthcare facilities and in a few different states before before she was uh finally uh uh, uh treated with uh I mean considered for early delivery. Those cases that I've seen uh, were delivered very. Uh, early because we work very close with our obstetricians, and uh, most of them recover. Uh, and this is the uh, case, the uh, the sickest one I have seen. Yes. Um. So acute fatty liver and pregnancy, although it is an emergency, is important to identify. It's probably not the the more common liver disease you see in a pregnant mm. uh female uh, uh, that you should encounter in your you know on call days and things like that. Okay. Yeah, so it says there's another question. Uh, it's uh, asking whether there's an association of low BMI and acute fatty liver pregnancy. Yeah, yes, there is. There, there is, and and you know that that patient that um the the case study that uh I talk about um yeah she only weighed thirty eight kilo, so right, yes uh right. so so she her BMI is very low and. Based on my personal experience as well, the, the one that uh, I encountered whilst I was in the UK, yeah, she's also a very like very thin, low BMI lady. And and just like what you say, she, she, the baby was delivered very fast and, and she recovered very soon, just a few days. You can see uh, a yeah. market improvement in the liver test. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So so it is, uh, you know, in contrast to methyl D, uh, both liver disease got fat uh, on imaging. Uh, this is a uh, uh, patient uh, of a lower BMI compared to the others. And also there's actually histologically, it can differentiate in terms of the fat. I think acute fatty liver pregnancy have microvesicular, whereas methyl D would have macrovesicular. Uh, so there's slight difference. So there's another question. Uh, it says, uh, thank you, thank you for the wonderful case. Uh, could something have been done earlier? Is her prefer uh, I assume referring to the case that you discussed, for example, when she presented to Kotobaru, should the baby have been delivered then? Yeah, so so the answer to the question uh comes down to having a, a high index of suspicion from the very beginning. So if you diagnose the patient to have acute fatty liver pregnancy at that point, then the, the patient should be optimized and the baby delivered as soon as possible, regardless of the gestation age of the baby. So yeah, that, that, that may be something that can be improved on, I think, yeah. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Dr. Wu, can I just ask you, uh, you know, uh, the, the bile acid measurement, should we do it uh, in a fasting uh, when the patient is fasted or we do not need to be worried about that? Yeah, so um, generally, no. Yes, there is data that um, postprandial bile acid level will be higher than, than okay. fasting bile acid level. But the study 
the studies that are done are not done in a fasting condition. So the outcome that we get are actually all postprandial sort of bile acid. So no, there is no need to be fasting bile acid level. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. In actual fact, I, I uh, usually uh, in Slayang, uh, when uh, uh, a pregnant patient with abnormal liver functions was referred to the trainees, they I usually make a point to go and see. And I noticed that I, uh, uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is actually quite common if you uh, look hard enough. And, uh, and also... Uh, it's not that easy, you know, to diagnose. There were a lot of misnormal in the name, intrahepatic cholestasis. The ALP can be raised, but you would think uh, it's not that raised. And the B can be, sometimes they are not jaundice. The most common presentation is actually not jaundice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, only about a third of them, the bilirubin can be raised. They tend yeah. to have more hepatocellular, actually. Dr. Exactly. Tan. The ALT and mm. ST mildly elevated, and you call that intrahepatic cholestasis. Mm. So sometimes if we, we are not, uh, mm. uh, um, you know, we don't look at it carefully. So the, the, the most important symptoms, I think, is pruritus. Is that correct, mm. the, Dr. Hu? Yeah, yes, correct. So pruritus can be very prominent in this group of patients. So sometimes when you do physical examination, you, you can actually see the scratch mark there. Oh, there is a proposal to change its name to Dr. Tan S. S. Sorry, I'm not sure what it means. Should I call you Tan S. S. Hu <laughs> I don't know. It's a question. Please propose to change the name. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Maybe intrahepatic cholestasis. No, ICP is still ICP. Unfortunately, I'm not that... Uh, uh, I'm not famous enough. I never discovered the disease. Okay. Um, any oh. other questions? The who I think uh, you also the, mentioned. The who, there's one question the, in the chat box. Oh, oh okay. Oh, uh, question in the chat, the chat box. Uh, chat box. Uh, ask, or would you like to ask? Uh, will the patient like with acute fatty liver in pregnancy have a higher chance of recurrence? If the rate is higher, anything which can which, which we can do to prevent that. All right. Yeah, very I, important I don't question. think there is data. Yeah, I, I don't think there is data that if you have uh, acute fatty liver in pregnancy once you can get it again. However, however, it is due to a uh fatty acid metabolism uh problem, right? So yes. um whether whether your next child has that same fatty acid uh, uh metabolic problem, if if that that happens, then yes. But otherwise, um, generally, generally no, it, it should not have a higher chance of recurrence. But I guess if let's say this is genetically uh relevant, then yeah, okay. Yeah, it's actually ICP who has quite a high chance of recurrence. Uh, uh, but this is more, yeah, this, this is, is about more fatty liver. liver metabolism. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the ICP got mutations, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm. The other things that you mentioned, uh, for patient with uh intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Uh, you know, measuring bowel acids is important, and and uh, when it is high, above or equal to forty, uh, uh, micromoles per liter, you consider using a uh, sodioxycholic acid, and it's been shown to have. You can it may it may cause the uh, ALTST to come down, and also may improve the pruritus, but not. Uh, that's only marginally, but the more important thing is it can decrease the, the rate of uh, spontaneous preterm uh, delivery. So you also mentioned using uh, cholestyramine. Would you like to explain how, how do you uh, in practice uh, dose your ERSO, uh, deoxycholic acid and cholestyramine? Presumably they know the, uh, when they are taken together, it can affect the absorption. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Thank, thank you for the question. So, uh, just now I did mention that uh, cholestyramine uh, sh should should be those two hour gap. 
from okay. other medications before and after. So in a patient whom, whom you need to give both UDCA as well as cholestyramine, and often that is the case, uh, you can give UDCA, say, at um, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., for example, and then okay. cholestyramine, say, at about 10 a.m., and uh, 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. So the, uh, having the gap of two hours uh, in order to ensure that there's good absorption of the UDCA. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more questions, Dr. Priscilla. Any more other questions that you can see? Um, no more, doctor. So shall we end early or... Yeah, I think we can end. Okay. Uh, so, all right then. Um, thank you very much for everyone's uh, uh, active participation. And of course, thank you, Dr. Hu, again for an excellent overview on liver disorders in pregnancy. And um, so, uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. We will go and continue our clinics, Dr. Hu. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Tan. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you for your time. Take care. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.